All right, ladies and all right, ladies and gentlemen, um, I'm going to start the Jane chapter that starts at page 63. Make sure you follow along with me while, with your eyes while I read out loud. And remember to take notes and pause the video if you're taking notes. Jane. Jane eased the heavy front door shut and tiptoed across the marble foyer. It was late. All the servants had gone to bed hours ago. She could see a thin strip of light on the floor, the only thing that showed under the door of Father's study. It would be nothing to tiptoe past that door. Jane inhaled deeply, just in case she'd have to hold her breath. But the inhalation brought with it a huge whiff of cigar smoke, also coming from Father's study, and Jane began to choke and cough. The door sprang open, and Father stood there brandishing a fireplace poker over his head. He lowered it a bit sheepishly when he saw that it was only Jane. Young lady, he said gruffly. Where have you been? Why isn't Miss Millhouse accompanying you? Jane finished coughing. She backed away from the larger billow of cigar smoke that had appeared when Father opened the study door. I was... I'm returning from an educational lecture, Jane said. I went with Eleanor Kensington, who's a Vassar student and very mature, and so Miss Millhouse's presence wasn't required. Very innocent, Jane told herself, and it was. She was telling the truth, but she felt guilty, as if father wouldn't approve if he knew the whole truth, if he knew how Jane had finagled to avoid taking Miss Millhouse along. None of the college girls had chaperones constantly babysitting them. Why should Jane? If he knew that Eleanor swore sometimes, she said dash it all just like a boy, and maybe wasn't as reputable as Jane implied. If he knew that the lecturer tonight had been talking about women's rights, what did father think of women's rights? Or if he knew that she and Eleanor and Eleanor's friends had gone to an ice cream parlor afterwards that maybe wasn't perfectly clean and maybe wasn't perfectly socially acceptable. Jane's friend Pearl had introduced her to Eleanor Kensington three months ago, and it had become common for Eleanor to invite Jane along for lectures and symposiums, academic talks, and social commentaries. At first, Pearl had gone too. But Pearl yawned and squirmed and elbowed Jane to whisper, Would it be rude to leave early? This is so boring. Jane thought a lot of it was boring too, but a lot of it was fascinating and had set Jane to wondering about everything. Was the speaker right that one who claimed, the one who claimed that there was enough wealth in America that no one should have to live in poverty? Who would care to work for, as servants then? How about the speaker who said that alcohol was the root of all evil? Jane had thought it was supposedly money, though Eleanor and her friends had looked up quotation up, looked the quotation up in the Bible and said it was actually the want of money that was evil, which wasn't exactly the same thing. Jane was still thinking about that one. And then there were all those women's rights lectures. Would the United States be a better place if women could vote? Jane favored her father with what she hoped was her most innocent-looking smile. And really, she said, trying to sound nonchalant, I'm coming home much earlier than if I'd been to a dance. Father scowled at her anyway, his thick black eyebrows beetling together. Jane had seen pictures of her father when he was young and handsome. She could understand why her mother stared at him so dreamily in their wedding pictures. They'd been a lovely couple, Jane's parents back before mother had taken sick and faded away. Now father was pot-bellied and balding and fierce, and Jean was more than a little afraid of him. You were with Eleanor Kensington, he muttered, of the shipping interest Kensingtons? I suppose, Jane said. She's Pearl's Kensington's cousin. Ah, father said, and Jane understood that he had just begun a calculation in his head judging the Kensington family's financial and social status relative to his own. They live near the Vanderbilts, Jane said. I see, father said. Eleanor had been judged acceptable. Does she perhaps have a brother? Jane blushed. This was new, father asking about eligible males, instead of simply counting on Miss Milhouse to shepherd Jane through the complexities of courtship. Jane felt a sudden pang of missing her mother. Surely, even as an invalid, Jane's mother would have cared enough to ask, was that boy kind enough when he asked you to dance? Did his eyes sparkle when you said yes, or was he just playing his role? And even, 
do you think you could love him? Rather than treating the whole marriage campaign like a military maneuver, a series of battles to be won or lost based on flounced dresses, tasteful decolletage, and discreet flirting. But not too much. Oh, no, not too much. Eh? Is there a brother? Father repeated awkwardly. Maybe he was blushing, too. Eleanor's brothers are older and already married, Jane said, trying to keep her voice steady. Ah, father said again. Jane wondered what would happen if she told him what the lecturer had said tonight about marriage. Women are not chattel to be traded off like cattle or hogs, she'd thundered out. We're not trophies to be placed in golden glass cases. We're human beings, and we deserve to be treated as such. We, like our husbands, should be allowed our own property. We, like our husbands, should have a say over the money we earn. We, like our husbands, should have a determining voice in the guardianship of our children. And we, like our husbands, should have the right to vote. Afterward, in the ice cream parlor, Jane had spooned butterscotch sundae into her mouth and listened to the debate swirling around her. Eleanor said the speaker had been particularly brave to take on the issues of marriage since Mrs. Belmont, who just donated a new headquarters for the suffrage movement, had forced her own daughter to marry against her will. Just because she wanted a royal title in the family, she made Consuelo marry that horrid duke who just wanted her money, Eleanor had said, even though Consuelo was in love with someone else and sobbed all the way through the wedding. That's the worst fad. Rich Americans marrying off their daughters to dusty old counts and such. It's barbaric, I say. Jane hadn't heard of anyone objecting before. Her old friends thought royalty was romantic. Wouldn't you want to be a duchess, she ventured timidly to Eleanor? Not unless I loved the duke. Not unless I loved him, regardless of whether he was a duke or a prince or, indu or an industrialist or a common old Joe. In other words, no. One of Eleanor's friends joked. And then they'd been off on another topic. The ideas flew by so quickly, Jane felt like she was watching a tennis match. Her head swam, but it was wonderful. Who'd known there were so many things to think about? Now father cleared his throat. We'll have to be very careful with this matter, father said. It will be important for you to make a good match. Something like that could make a big difference in my business. A year ago, a month ago, maybe even a day ago, Jane would have been flattered that he thought anything about her was important, that he noticed her at all. But with the woman's rights lecture still echoing in her ears, she heard him differently now. So, marrying me off could make a big difference in his business, Jane thought. What about the difference it would make in my life? He, doesn't th he does think I'm chattel, just something to trade for something else he wants more. Jane tried to ignore the ache in her heart. She stared past him into his study with its dark wood, its leather chairs, its cloud of cigar smoke. The whole room reeked of power and masculinity. Once, when she was four or five, she tried to hide under his desk during a birthday party game of hide and seek. Father had come in unexpectedly and scolded, now, now, this is no place for a little girl, out. Perhaps he'd only meant that he didn't want his children or he didn't want children ruffling through his business papers, but he didn't want part that he didn't want party games interrupting his work. But Jane had understood him to mean much, much more. She'd looked down at her lacy white party dress with a pink ribbon sash and felt ashamed, as if she'd been trying to pass herself off as a boy, as if she'd been trying to pass herself off as important. Jane had mostly done everything she could to avoid his study ever since. But she wasn't a little girl anymore. And what use was it to go, to go to women's rights lectures if she just stood there silently while her father decided her entire life? But father, she said slowly, trying to keep the tremble out of her voice, maybe I'm not ready yet to think about any of that. Maybe I won't be ready for years. Maybe I'd like to, to go to college first. College, father growled, as though he'd never heard of such a thing, even though he had his own Yale diploma hanging on his study wall. A college for women, Jane said hastily. They have lots of them now. Vassar, Smith, Barnard. Father was scowling and shaking his head. 
Why, that's preposterous, he said. Almost as preposterous as women wanting to vote. Well, so that was what he thought of women's rights. A year ago, a month ago, maybe even a day ago, it wouldn't have mattered. But now, somehow, it did. Somehow, it made Jane feel that he'd always see her as he saw her when she was five. A frilly, useless, annoying girl in a frilly, useless, annoying dress. Jane had just finished hearing dozens of reasons why women should be allowed to vote. Dozens of reasons why women should be allowed to go to college. But right now, she wasn't capable of telling her father any of them. She could only swallow hard and tiptoe away and hope she made it to her room before she began to cry. <laughs>